So I, I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, specifically introduce this from the, the point of view of, like, I, I'm not going to talk about the physical interpretation of it, because that's where the fun really, really begins. Um, I'm just strictly going to view it as a mathematical thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain how mathematically we handle it, and just as a bit of a history here. So ultimately, what we are going to find is that the Lorentz transformations, unlike the Galilean transformations, the Lorentz transformations seem to allow us to view the laws of physics the same in all reference frames. Um, and that example that we went through of the, the, the charge moving through a magnetic field, when we apply the Lorentz transformation, something really special happens. So, so we'll see what that is. Um, but the, the, the long and short of this, this is, it turns out to be the answer. It was known well before Einstein's time. He didn't invent this. He just said, oh, hey, here's some obscure mathematical thing that, that was shown a while back. If we apply it to here, let's put it together and see how things mesh. So I'm strictly just going to go through the mathematical derivation, or not even the derivation, but just the mathematical operation, and then we're going to talk about how that actually turns out to be like crazy in the end. So again, it's a way to, to convert a coordinate system S into S prime, or you can do it backwards, of course. And the important thing here is that what we're going to find is that this has different invariants than does the Galilean transformations. And when I say that on an, an invariant quantity, by that I mean if you view something in one reference frame and if you view it and measure it to be the same in another, we say it's invariant between all reference frames. And what we saw in, in um, the previous example with Galilean transformations the laws of, electromagne of the, the, the electromagnetic forces, specifically. The magnetic force that we view in one frame was not invariant when we look at it in another. So the Galilean transformations did not cause forces to be invariant. That's kind of the holy grail of what we're asking for. How can we transform from one coordinate to another that leaves the laws of physics, or the forces that we observe, to be invariant no matter which frame? And, and so, again, just the setup here, we're going to have a, a, an original reference frame. We're going to call it S. And we're going to have this, the standard layout X, Y, and Z. And then, again, I'll try to be consistent here. We're going to have some other coordinate system, S prime, whose X and Y, sorry, the Y and Z coordinates match up. They're parallel but they may be moving, or they are moving in the x direction. So the x prime coordinates will be the only thing that changes. So the motion is entirely in the x direction, and, and that's, that's the, the basic setup they're always going to use. And again, if you're accusing me of saying this is a, a very special case, what if they're oriented at any other angle? Again, my response is, face forwards, dummy. So in other words, if they're not set up so that the x direction is in the direction of motion, change it. And you're always allowed to rotate your coordinate system arbitrarily. And this is actually, it's another fundamental assumption of physics. But physics should not look the same if you're looking left versus right versus up, you know, unless there's a gravitational field. But even so, the mathematical description doesn't matter whether it's in the x or the y direction. So if you're not already oriented, reorient your axes so that the x directions all line up and then begin the process is, is all I have to say to that. Now, what we're going to say here is let's assume we, and, and let's, let's make sure I'm doing this properly. Um, let's go from the, let's do the, the standard, yeah, I'll call them the, let's assume that we know the coordinates x, y, z, and t in s. So specifically, there is some, and I'm going to use a new word here, event. There's, there's a space-time event. So we're using fancy words now, but that's actually what we call it. A space-time event, and we're going to label the coordinates as x, y, z, and it occurs as measured at time t, according to person s, or frame s. And so let's say for that event, we know those exact coordinates, and then 
uh, we want to calculate the coordinates in S prime, which we're viewing as X prime, Y prime, uh, Z prime, and notice that I've subtly done something there. I'm not going to say anything else about that. But be careful with the apostrophes, the, the primes, and everything there was very intentional. So this is what our Galilean transformations allowed us to do before, but we found that there was, a, there was that error that when we used those Galilean transformations and viewed the frames of, or viewed relativity, viewed electricity from a different frame of reference, it didn't pr preserve those forces. Let's show how to properly make those transformations and then seeing and confirming that it actually abides with everything is gonna be a much longer process. But this is, the, the actual transformations themselves are quite simple. So this is a proper Lorentz transformation. I'm gonna first of all try to calculate, I'm just gonna do it as kind of a string of four equations, x equals, y equals, uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna do x prime equals, y prime equals, z prime equals, t prime equals. So we're assuming that we know what the coordinates are already in the unprimed system. Now, instead of just writing x minus vt, which would be appropriate there for Galilean transformations, here's what we're going to do. We're going to arbitrarily, and again, I'm making sure I do this right, we're going to arbitrarily insert a factor of 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. I hope you can read that. So it's 1 minus the square root of, so yeah, 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared. It's equivalent. Now that multiplies x minus vt. So notice that if I remove that, this looks exactly like what, what we had called the Galilean transformations from s to s prime. So that's precisely the same. The only difference is now we're going to multiply, we're, we're going to put in a scaling factor. And I'll talk about this here momentarily, but the scaling factor is based on the relative velocity v and the speed of light c. Now, when Lorentz, the, the mathematician originally did this, this could have been any, any two speeds, a speed, the, the transformation, the, the, the relative speed between the two, and some other speed c, but I think it's pretty clear what speed that has to be. When, when I write it as c, I mean a very specific speed c. So all he did was take the Galilean transformation and make that a little bit, turns out, larger is what that is. Now, according to Lorentz transformations, just like Galilean transformations, the only effect occurs, at least spatially, the only effect occurs in the direction of motion. The directions perpendicular to motion do not change. So specifically, y prime is the same as y. z prime is the same as z. Those two directions perpendicular to the direction of motion do not get affected whatsoever. However, and this is where the big difference is. Notice before I wrote a different variable t prime than t. What Lorentz transformations uh, uh, explicitly do not preserve is time. Lorentz transformations take a, a very big conceptual leap, a leap, <laughs> jeez. <laughs> and they, uh, mathematical transformations do not assume that time is the same in all frames. And that's the fundamental difference between them, both mathematically and intellectually. So what the Lorentz transformations predict now is that the time coordinate will transform slightly differently. And we're going to have that same weird factor, 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And now that's going to multiply a slightly different factor here. And that factor is t minus, now it's a little bit complicated, x v over c squared. So this is essentially just some, so I mean, 
up here we saw this was the same as the Galilean transformations. This used to just be T prime equal T. Now that we see all that, that mess there, um, you know, honestly, at least right now, it's best just to kind of try to memorize this half of the equation here. Um, you can kind of rederive it from dimensional analysis, and, you know, and, but at the same time, this is a proper Lorentz transformation. This is how to transform all four space-time variables. And that's the word that Einstein used. We're now describing space in necessarily a four vector. There are three spatial dimensions and one time dimension there. And this is directly how those spatial dimensions transform. Notice that in order to calculate the time, so the position x prime, we're including not only the spatial dimension x, but the time dimension t in s. Same thing here. In order to recalculate maybe some other offset time t prime, it includes the time in frame s as well as the x position and, and the velocity. Now, those should be a really strange thing to you. You shouldn't have to recalculate a time based on a position. Recalculate a position based on a time. But this is the fundamental difference of how these transformations uh, change. They now, the one way you can say it, is they now fold in dimensions of both space and time together to produce, say, a spatial dimension. You take into account both t prime and s, uh, t prime and x prime to get x. You take into account uh, uh, x and t to get t prime. So we're naturally including both spatial and uh, uh, time dimensions together into the same mathematical framework. And that's why we call it space-time. We can no longer completely separate space and time because in order to properly calculate the laws of physics in frame S versus S prime versus any other frame, we naturally have to include the different spatial and uh, temporal units together into one main quantity. Isn't that neat? So the last thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rephrase a few of these variables and I'm gonna write them up in a slightly more contact, compact manner, but that's the essence of a Lorentz transformation. That's how they, they fundamentally differ from the Galilean ones. Okay, so yeah, these are, are the two formal sets of Lorentz transformations. Now these are the, you know, the, the standard or the forward uh, transformations where if you know the coordinates in X or the coordinates uh, system S, you can now turn it into the coordinates that would appear in S prime. And then same thing over here, if you know the coordinates in S prime, on the right-hand side, and I need to change that, then you can calculate the coordinates in, in the frame S. <coughs> Excuse me, okay. So um, the other thing you'll notice is that to, to make it simpler, we always use these gamma factors, and we just simply write that as one minus, and now I've written this beta, uh, beta as V over C. This is the, the, the uh, velocity ratio or the speed ratio how fast are our coordinate systems moving relative to the speed of light? So this will, of course, always be less than, well, I don't want to say it'll be less than one, but uh, we'll see why that has to be true. But long story short, though, we write our gamma factor like that, and we tend to abbreviate V over C just as beta when all possible. Now, I'm, I'm really strongly resisting the urge here to actually go into further detail because this is where the fun really begins, setting these up and solving them for different coordinates. Um, but... That's going to have to wait until the next, uh, the next lecture. And also, um, this is what we're going to actually be doing for those guys in, in the course here, um, going through and calculating different space-time differences in S and S prime using these coordinate transformations. And that's where you're going to see for yourself exactly how to transform different you know, lengths in S to S prime and how those actually work out. You'll see how to transform um, you know, time elements, delta T into delta T prime, and see how those transform. And the cool, the, the cool result is that it's not always going to be what you expect. So, so I do think that's going to be the end of what we talk about here today. Uh, well, wh one more thing you might know, and, and we will talk about this next time. Um, I encourage you to try to write this up into a linear algebra form. So you can see if we have, for example, a on this side here, if we have a vector that we view as x, y, z, t, and you can create a matrix which operates on that vector to produce x prime, y prime, z prime, t prime. So, so I, I encourage you guys to just on your own, think about how to turn this into linear algebra form because that's actually the simplest way to, to uh, write all of this here. Um, but anyway, that's gonna be it for today. Um, I'll go ahead and pause it here and uh, take questions. Otherwise, we'll continue with um, 
uh, some more examples of how these Lorentz transformations actually give us really strange results on Thursday.